Good evening and welcome to this uh, fascinating webinar on um, using sentiment extremes. My name's Charlie Burton and in conjunction with Tigmill here, we're bringing this presentation uh, for you. And so all the information in this uh, webinar is information that I use uh, personally with some of my trading. And and why, do, why have I said some of my trading? Well, <laughs> Um, you can't, there's not extremes every day of the week. <laughs> so, um, so when it's there, as we'll show you here this evening, then it's fantastic. The, um, just moving some stuff around here off screen. Uh, and I'm also going to be showing you the tools that you can use, uh, to replicate what I do. Everything that I'm using is most of the stuff that I'm using is freely available. Uh, there's one thing one piece of software that I use, which uh, does come at a cost, but you don't have to have it. So uh, let's get started. Okay, as usual, we have to go through the risk disclaimer. So disclaimer, um, as usual here, is that the material provided is for information purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. The views, information and opinions expressed in the text belong solely to the author, me, and not to the organisation, committee or other group or individual company. Okay, so let's get into this. Let's go through the overview before we properly get started. Now, we all know... Uh, can someone answer uh, JSEC's uh, question there for me? He's um, obviously struggling with audio. Just uh, let him know that I am running, and he needs. if you can't hear me, he needs to reboot um, uh, his end and log back in. So... We all know about retail stats, or well, most of us do anyway. So retail stats are that, uh, unfortunately, um, <laughs> um, when a market goes up, retail start shorting. Thank you, folks. Thank you very much. Uh, retail start shorting. That it, it, the and when I, not all retail, because all of us here tonight, myself included, are considered retail. If you trade your own money then you are considered retail. I trade professionally as well. I trade, I manage funds, but I still manage my own money as well. So I'm still considered a retail trader as well. So not all trade retail traders will be going against the trend. But what we know when I said about the stats is it's about 80% or so of retail will end up getting short when a market is going up and they'll get long when a market is going down. That's just what they do. Um, we have the stats on it. In fact, the CEO of, I think it was the CEO, or one of the founders of Tickmill said this just last week, um, that a very high percentage they see of traders on their books will just go and do the opposite of what the market is doing. So anyway, that's what retail do. <laughs> so being on the opposite side of what retail are doing can be good. And so we are Oh, I see. So okay. So we are uh going to be looking at retail information here, but not just retail. Because some of you will already look at retail stats. So what resources can we use and how do we use them? That's what's more important here tonight. You know, we can see when retail are short a market or long a market, but how do we go about using that? That's what we're going to be using it going through tonight. And of course, what should, should we always follow the professionals, the fund managers? So we're going to be looking at fund managers and, and where they're positioned in the markets as well and how we can use that information when we see fund managers um, doing certain things in the markets as well, trading in the futures markets. Plus, what about financial industry journalists as well? You know, Bloomberg, Reuters, you name it, uh, The Economist, you name it. All of these uh, financial industry journalists, um, what about them? And so how can we use that as a sentiment tool as well? So there's lots of sentiment tools that we can use. And what we're all, what we're really looking for are extremes at times. However, as I've put here, 
But first, and I've put a link up here, and I'm going to just quickly come off of the slideshow because I need to show you something here. In conjunction with Tickmill, um, Tickmill have made it available to you to... Um, just going to pop this into the box. Uh, let's see if I can do this um, as well. Tickmill have made it available that if you open an account with Tickmill, you can join my community. I have a uh, an online trading community. Like I said, I'm an FCA regulated uh, authorized money manager here in the UK and um, I manage money here professionally um, but I have a an online trading room and I have as you can see a, um, a load of trading resources all of my strategies but we do training sessions or should I say trading room sessions every day of the week or five days of the week so uh, it's normally 123 pounds per month but you can get it for entirely free if you open up an account with Tickmill. All you need to do is go to uh, this link, which I'm just going to pop into the, the box here. And if you use that link, then you can go and check that out. Don't do it now, but by all means, go and do that uh, later. So it's a great deal. Um, I've been working with Tickmill for some time now, and there's some information on that site, who I am and all that stuff, and um, and what you get from that, just by having an account there with Tickmill. Right, uh, let's get back to the slides. Okay. Okay, so we're going to go straight in here. And so we're going to start off with journalists and what financial journalists do, because they are one of the best indicators of sentiment there is when sentiment reaches an extreme. So this article here from Bloomberg Business Week um, was taken from, I think it's the 5th of October there, 2022. I was using this with my traders and with my funds um around that time big headline can't stop won't stop the fed was the fed have turned the us dollar into a wrecking ball and there's no end in sight to the carnage and funnily enough where did uh that article come out right up near to close to the highs up here in early october of 2022 if you go and check out a dollar index you'll see that it topped out in October or by it was either right at the end of September or early October of 2022 right the, the article couldn't have come out better so why would the financial journalist come out with an article like that you know right you know, near the top well for starters they don't know that we're near a top they are just journalists after all they are just human beings they're not traders they are purely human beings who uh, get excited like any other human being when they see a market moving in a given way they have to report on what's going on in the markets so when a market such as a dollar throughout 2022 for those of you who were trading in 2022 was having this tremendous run and of course there's going to be a point when they're going to start writing about it saying this is just you know the dollar's just on a surge <laughs> and um so they're going to write about it. But by the time they write about it, it's so often the case that the bulk of the run is already done. And they get excited, so to speak, to write an article that's headline grabbing and all that. So it's a classic there um, to have that sort of article written um, just as the dollar was coming into major resistance. <laughs> So that was a good example. Let's go through some more. Um, this was the same time, actually. 5th of October again, Bloomberg. Traders pile on strong dollar bets whilst bond yields march higher. The dollar rises against every other major currency since mid-July. So again, big hit around that same time. Traders piling on strong dollar bets. What was going on at that point? That's where... Oh, oh this is a different one. Sorry, this is uh, not 2022. This is a year later. October of 2023. So uh, at that point, the the dollar had had a lovely three month run 
to the upside. This is a weekly chart I've taken a screenshot from. And literally, it's just gone up solidly for three months. What happens is we go and get a Bloomberg article come out, among others, of course, and uh, around that time, and uh you know that that marked a high in the dollar and the fact fact is the dollar hasn't been higher since but uh, that was only last uh october so just giving you a a sense of sentiment out there we don't trade just based on sentiment and just say oh look, this article's out therefore uh the journalist you know using it as a contrarian signal therefore i, I must just go and short the dot uh, short the dollar you can only use it when it's in conjunction with other other things. So the sentiment is part of uh, an accompaniment to your other trading signals. So whatever they may be. So for example, if the dollar at that point in um, October of last year had come into a load of resistance for you, or uh, you know you had a load of signals coming in from your particular method of trading well you know that would make sense then that you'd say okay this is quite interesting we've got a lot of uh from a sentiment perspective uh the sentiment's getting frothy here um i can use that as a contrarian signal because journalists tend to get it wrong a lot of the time they get excited one if there's a, a strong run for a while that's the thing if there's a strong run for a while and then you start seeing uh, these sorts of articles then pay attention Then around that same time, different uh, article, strong dollar remains the only game in town. <laughs> so again, if I now come to actually, uh, no, no, let's go back. Um, let me just come out of that for a second here and just look at the dollar index here. I've got this on a daily chart. So you can see, uh, you know, this is when those articles were coming out just in early October of last year. And, uh, the, um, and yet, just as those articles are coming out, what's the dollar doing? Oh, oh it's um, it's topping out. If you didn't have any reason to sell, then you don't sell anyway. But um, these sorts of articles, seeing major publications which are highly read uh, coming out with those sorts of stories, certainly can give you a heads up um, that, oh, okay, what's going on over here on the dollar index at the moment? It's just had a three-month you know, straight upwards run are there any sell signals coming in? You know, it's that type of thing, using it as a contrarian contrarian indicator. And uh, and then, funny enough, the, the dollar then fell all the way into um, December of this year and then rallied and then pulled back into um, March time of uh, this year as well. So let's go now back to the slides because on the next slide <laughs> 20th April 20th of April Financial Times investors raise bets on the euro falling to parity with the dollar and it, I've already put the arrow on there this is where the euro dollar was at that point 20th of April the euro bottoms on the 16th of April just four days later bearing in mind they probably write the articles several days before it actually comes out um <laughs> Uh, investors raise bet, raise bets on the euro going to parity. Well, the euro dollar at that time was sitting around the 106 zone in April of this year, and again, you couldn't have timed it better. <laughs> so, and I'll go back to the chart in a moment. I was actually at a presentation evening in the city in London, uh, literally down near those lows. And there was a lot of macro traders there that evening. And the macro guys, the fundamental guys, um, they were all saying the same thing. They were all saying, oh, you know, yeah, Euro's going to go down to parity, um, you know, back down to one uh, against the dollar. And, um, and yet um, that was back in April. And the Euro, as of today, is currently sitting just above 109. So um, it's not to say that macro people and fundamental people are wrong all the time because of course they're not going to be but their level of excitement at the prospect of the euro coming down was a warning signal to me 
at that time, thinking there seems to be a lot of excitement here from a lot of macro people um, about the euro going down. And again, I'll always use that as a potential contrarian indicator. And of course, at the same time, we've got the FT saying something similar. So I'm looking for all the reasons why maybe the euro goes the other way. And again, if I just come out of there and show now the euro dollar at that time, that was those April lows there, and the euro hasn't been lower since. It's not to say that at some point in the future it might roll over, but uh, that was back in April when those that sort of sentiment was there. So I think you get my, my point here that um there are plenty of instances when by the time journalists write about a move uh quite often it's getting or has already uh reached its climax uh yes oh hi irish um yes of course i'm just keeping it all clean for tonight but yes oh yeah of course i'm you know, what we're talking about at the moment and here tonight is about sentiment. So I'm not going into the technicals of what what to use in conjunction with this. I've done previous webinars uh, on technicals. Uh, tonight is just about sentiment and saying, ah, right, I can take some of that sentiment information and use it in conjunction with my trading. Um, so, yeah, but yes, that's what I do. Yes, of course. I am using it in conjunction with, well, have I got, you know, any buy signals coming in down in this zone? Because I'm getting lots of, you know, sentiment from the journalists and the likes, which is, you know, I want to use as a contrarian in indicator itself. So that's how I'm using it. And that's how I'm suggesting that you can use it here. Anyway, let's have a look. I think I've got a couple, a couple more slides here. Now, this is an interesting one. It's in the bond market. So, again, this year, just a, literally just a couple of months ago, extreme bond market shorts, gamble on a hawkish power pivot. When was that article? Well, the hawkish power pivot was coming into the uh, FOMC, which was on when? The 1st of May, 31st of April, and the 1st of May is the meeting. So right here. So that article must have come out just a few days beforehand. Hedge funds, CTAs build bearish positions ahead of the Fed meeting. What happened to bond market? It went up <laughs> and has continued going up ever since then. So please take note. And I know many of you, I'm, at the moment, I'm showing you information that you already know. But not everyone will know this, and I'm going to be moving on to other uh, resources that you can use here. So um, it is quite incredible the ability of financial publications to put out articles uh, right at the wrong time. However, however, having said that, If you're asking questions, I need to just carry on with what I'm doing at the moment. I will answer your questions uh, when we get to the Q&A part. I have to put something else in because I quite like this one. This one came in. This was on four in Forbes just last weekend. So an imminent stock market correction warning suddenly flashed red just as the S&P 500 made new highs. I think that came out on Saturday or Sunday of last week. So to be fair to that one, <laughs> well, yeah, the stock market, the S&P has just come down the last two days. So I'll give it that. Having said that, the stock markets, if they're riding a what we call a wall of worry. So if there's lots of negative articles coming out, we should normally see them as, as a because they normally get it wrong, um, as a contrarian, a contrarian indicator. So if we're getting negative articles coming out in major publications, then any pullbacks that we get are probably going to just be short-term pullbacks. Because if there's that amount of concern and worry in the market, the market has an amazing ability to do the opposite. If we had articles coming out which were saying the opposite of this and saying, oh, the market's going to continue booming and the S&P is going to go to, you know, 7,000. 
then I'd be getting worried. <laughs> so, um, so this, although the S and P's come down yesterday and today, um, this was last week. The S and P was up the beginning of this week. Um, I, I would be looking at this as, oh, okay, you know, just another indicator that there's too many bears out there in the market. As soon as we, you know, the mark, they're constantly trying to call a top. And I'm seeing lots of this sort of stuff. And um, so overall, of course, markets are still going to breathe in and out. The S&P is still going to do that. It's going to have its pullbacks. But overall, I'm taking that as a signal that this bull market has not finished yet. So, okay. Let's move on. Oh, thanks, Johan. Right, okay. Okay, so whereas retail tend to go against the trend, and I'm going to spend a lot of time here on retail uh, in a bit, the large speculators, the big players, fund managers and very large speculators, are rarely correct at major support and resistance. So uh, large speculators and hedge funds are more likely to be going with the trends. Retail are shorting <laughs> as markets are going up and the large speculators most of the time are going to be going with that. Now, the only thing is because they're, they're big players, they're not trying to catch a top necessarily uh, or a bottom. So when a top does come in, they are normally, you know, fully long at this point you know sometimes in quite a sizable position um because they won't start coming out of the positions until the market starts rolling over um so there are points when the big funds reach extremes in their positioning and we're going to go through that right now so when they reach extremes in positioning is quite a useful thing to see, oh, okay, collectively they're an extreme. So if they're an extreme longs, for example, and the market starts to correct, well, that's going to start forcing them to come out of their longs, which adds to the selling, which can ex exasperate the downside and create a larger downside move. And the opposite is true as well. There are other things that they do as well. It's just... Uh, whereby, you know, a market's going up, but actually, and they've been long, so they have been long, but as it as the market keeps going up, they become less long. <laughs> so they actually start trimming some of their profits, and t banking some of their profits. So as the market carries on going up, there's a bit of a divergence between the large speculators and what the market's doing. So let's go and have a look at that right now firstly um we've just got a an old chart here from uh wherever this has come from atlas investor as a uh, yeah as a source so this is looking at the uh, the us dollar uh, in the top part of the screen here and below we just have a histogram of hedge fund positioning so my point is, like down here, so when the dollar was coming down through this phase here through 2010, 2011, quite rightly, hedge funds are overall net short. So adding up all their long positions and short positions brings them out at a net short position overall. But as you can see, they're pretty much, you know, very highly short right down at the point that the dollar has made its lows. But that makes sense because they're just going to follow the trends. So it's only once the dollar starts to turn and once it starts changing its trend that they start to end up getting net long. So they're not going to be a lot of the time correct at major lows or at major highs. Look, they're net long up here. They're not short, so they're not getting clever. They're not trying to be clever a lot of the time. 
Um, they're just riding the trends until those trends roll over and then they, they quickly come out of those positions. And sometimes they get caught as well. So these hedge fund managers, they're not always going to be completely correct. Like uh, they just got short on balance down here only for the market to then switch and go higher again, the dollar index to go higher again. But what you do see is that they'll very quickly get back in line with that trend. Now, what retail will be doing is the opposite. Retail, you imagine through through this phase here, this very ultra strong run uh, back in 2014, retail are all shorting and blowing up their accounts because that's what they do. <laughs> um, so, whereas hedge fund managers will be getting in on that. So, what we can take from this is that from a positioning perspective, Hedge fund managers are will be good at riding the trends, but they won't be good overall um, at major turns. However, sometimes they start lightening off their positions, like over here. Although they were still long here into this top here, and again, they were long into this top here, but as you can see, overall... Their positioning wasn't as great in this phase here as it was over here, even though the dollar had gone higher. So there was a divergence between their positioning. They're still long, but just not as as long. So these are some of the things that we can use. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to go back over to the charts and some websites to show you how I use this information and how you can use it in for your own trading okay so uh if we come over to uh this first uh website here you can see it's called tradingstir.com forward slash cot c-o-t okay the commitment of traders reports i can't do a whole uh webinar on what the commitments of traders report is uh, and the various breakdowns, so you can have to just go with it, <laughs> go with what I'm saying here. So the Commitment of Traders, very quickly, shows large speculators' positions in the future, in the financial futures markets. So large speculators, uh, when they have positions above a certain size, they have to report it to uh, the regulatory bodies. And so those reported positions get logged into uh, the commitment of traders reports trading stir put all that together into some nice simple uh, um, data so as i scroll down here you can get um cot reports commitment of traders for you know, and see what these large speculators these hedge funds are doing in the australian dollar the pound dollar load of currencies there bitcoin even in the futures market that is for bitcoin stock indices i'm going to show you all of this grains livestock you name it gold silver okay when you're using it if you start using this and you want to look at the s p don't use the stock index here you want to use the e-mini uh this is the better uh data on the e-mini here and you want to use the cot legacy um the cot uh, the link to the cot is different. It gives all sorts of breakdowns. Um, I just use, in the main, the cot legacy uh, link there. Right. So when you come to that that website, it'll come up with adverts and stuff on it, but it's all free. And I'm going to show you what to do with that. So here's one I have prepared earlier. <laughs> so this actually is the S&P. So I just clicked on this this morning and so when you first click on it so if we go back to that and if i clicked on the cot legacy link down here where my cursor is then um that will take me through to this page here okay s p e mini great okay now the cot data is released every friday um so this data was released last friday and uh, the next data will be released tomorrow evening and it gives us the data up to the prior tuesday night's trading so this data as of right now is over a week old okay and some of you will be thinking oh that's no good well 
it doesn't matter actually because we're not trying to use it as an absolute timing tool we're using it as an overall picture tool so it is still very useful so what we can see last week is that there was uh, an increase in short positions we're only interested in non-commercials non-commercials are your hedge, hedge fund managers the commercials are the banks and brokers who uh, create the market that they buy their contracts from their futures contracts from so we don't need that that's just the um the broker and we don't need non reporter reportables either they're just smaller positions so we're only interested in non-commercials so what we can see is there was a trimming of long positions last week and an increase in shorts okay that was up to tuesday of last week now if I go to back to the charts for a moment here, and if I bring up the S&P, uh, which has come down, as we can see, uh, the last two days. But as of Tuesday last week, that was back down here. So they started increasing shorts. Some of them did. Um, but the, you know, the S&P carried on going higher. They don't care about that sort of thing. They're, they've got very deep pockets. So anyway. We're not trying to use it as a timing tool. If you try and use it as a timing tool, you'll get your your you know your head handed to you. So we don't really need that even. I'm just showing you what that is. So what you do is you scroll down until you get to the, the chart here, the blue chart. Now, when you do click down here, I've already unclicked them, it'll look like this because it'll show the commercial positions, the non-commercial, and the non-reportables. Well, we don't want the non-reportables, they're no good. And remember, we don't want the commercials because that's just the banks and the brokers that the hedge funds are using. So we don't need to know what they're doing because they're just doing the opposite of because they're uh, selling whilst they're buying. So um, we only want to know what the hedge fund managers are doing. OK. Now, what was fascinating on this on the S on the S&P last year was that hopefully you can see down here 2023 uh their net positioning was at new lows for the prior 10 years plus okay we're it was actually a lot more than that i've got a friend who works at one of the big investment banks it was going all the way back to like 2010 11 so it was the highest or the biggest net short positioning that we'd seen in uh 12 years 13 years okay but at that time, the S&P um, ha was generally, it already made its low in the latter part of 2022 and was already coming up. And yet they were still at extreme lows. Like I said, they're not always right. When they reach extremes, we have to make note. So let's go back and have a look and see what that S&P chart looked like at that time. So if we go back to 2023, at that time, in which was in the april time of last year look at the s p it's bobbing its head against this resistance zone trying to break out having made its low in october of 2022 it's been going up and yet they've got an extreme short position so i was trading this last year and so all we needed was a breakout which came up here so i bought over here and because if we break out and we start coming up what are they going to have to do with their short positions in the futures markets they're going to have to start covering them cover your short positions that is buying helping to propel the stock market higher so it was a classic example of how even the professionals the big funds and the likes can get it get on the wrong side of the market at times so going back to the report They'd receive, you know, so that's important. If we see, you know, uh, new lows that are the lowest point for the last 10 years or more, then we have to take note. There is an element of context, but the context was good. We got a stock market was which was gently going up versus all of this extreme positioning. So all we needed was that S&P to break out there like it did and they're probably going to have to start covering. So this is where we start seeing how we can utilize this information. So anyway, so that's one there on the S&P. Let's go to another example, 
uh, for now the euro dollar. Now, this is where the big players were generally right. Okay. So, um, we're going back to 2000, January of 2017, about here. So this is on the euro dollar. So you can see that their overall positioning, although even at that point it was still below zero, so it was still net negative, but we can see that they'd made the biggest low back in their positioning back in 2015 when the euro dollar had come down. The euro dollar came down lower again at the end of 2015. Uh, 15 and yet their positioning wasn't moving to new lows and then again as we came down into the beginning of 2017 their positioning was going up even though the euro had come down so let's go and have a look at that euro dollar chart at that stage if i put this onto a weekly chart take it back there we go so at that stage, we've got these uh, lows in the euro dollar. Uh, here, there's the one late um, 2015, and then right at the beginning of 2017. So by that point in early 2017, they were diverging against their posi their positioning was they were lightening all of their shorts. So if I go back, uh, wrong one. there we go. We can see that they were lightening their shorts and it was right up here that January of 2017. So that's where we get a divergence between their positioning, what they're doing overall and what a market's doing. Let's move on again. Another one. Now, this was an interesting one. Euro dollar from last year. Now, again, this was another trade that I was taking last year. So you can now see that this is into July of last year. First of all, actually, let's go to July of last year so you can see what the euro was doing then. Okay, so into July of last year, this was the highs here in July of last year. I'd been long going all the way into that and as it rolled over, I got trading stopped out. Fair enough, somewhere um, I'd banked some profit and then got trading stopped out on the rest. And then ended up going short because there were divergences on the euro itself. I did a, uh, a webinar on divergences. You can get them from that web page that I just gave, gave you. That webinar is on the website that I gave earlier on. I'll, I'll go through this website again. But if you scroll down, I think we've got the past webinars on there. There we go. Load of past webinars that I've done here and you can click through them and there's loads on there. I'll come back to that in a bit. So I was having to uh, go short there in the July time of last year based on technical divergences. But again, from a sentiment perspective, going back to the COP report, where are we now? Uh, there it is. Um, I could see that the professional the big players when the euro did make those new highs in july they weren't in their positioning and their positioning started rolling off as the euro was making new highs so again a little bit of a clue there um and then aligned with the technicals it always has to align with the technicals on the charts as well and your and your you know the patterns you follow but again from a sentiment perspective it leaves clues so that was another nice example what, are, what else have i got here um oh okay so this is the aussie dollar uh, i'm just going to double check yeah this is the australian dollar now coming into this year coming into basically april of this year so if i oh so we've got it's made new lows down there in April of this year. If I zoom back, you can use this toggle bar and take it all the way back so we can see over the last 10 years. Ah, so coming into uh, April of this year, the, the big players had all got to fresh new lows in their short positioning over the entirety of the last prior 10 years. Well, what was the Aussie dollar doing at that time? Okay, 
Let's go to the Aussie, put it onto a daily chart because it was only uh, recently. Yeah, the Aussie, put my trend lines on. Oh, Aussie was coming down in April into this zone. They're all net short, but new extremes in shorts. And yet we were coming into technical levels. I need to go right away out onto, onto a bigger time frame. There we go. So now you can see this long-term trend line as we're coming down into this technical level. And if you've got buy signals down in that zone, um, then again, could they be about to get caught in their positioning? Oh, yeah. And if they get caught, there's a lot of positioning that they need to unwind. So just another example there. Right, okay. Let's move on to, I think I've got one more here. Um, this one is right now. So right now on the pound dollar, the pound dollar positioning is at new highs right now. So over the last 10 years, I've got this taken back to 2004, end of 2014 there. So pound positioning is at new highs in the futures markets. Now that doesn't guarantee that, oh, therefore, oh, the pound has to roll over because context is an important thing, as I've been talking about. In fact, um, there are times when they can be, and as I've already shown, they can be um, positioned in a way that, you know, it takes quite a while before a market rolls over. Um, so anyway, so what does this mean? Well, we're certainly at new highs in, in pound positioning, but I think we've got to, as I said, we got to put it into context. So if I take this to the pound, and if I take this to maybe a monthly chart, we see the pound's been generally in a downwards tr trend in the bigger, in the grand scheme of things over the last 10 years. Yes, over the last two years, it's been coming up. So I think that from a context perspective, that Yes, they've broken out to new highs in positioning, but generally the pound's been in a long-term downwards trend. So when we look at that positioning, we have to put it into context and say, ah, going back to the positioning, although they're breaking out to new highs in their positioning here, well, in the context of the fact that over the prior 10 years, the pound's been generally coming down. So they're not, not going to be in that bigger long positions over that prior 10 years so again contextually i would read this and say look look at the pound dollar it's only but just starting to break out of long-term trend lines and whatnot here so again in that context that sentiment i would i would not be getting too concerned at this stage that uh oh there's going to be a you know a huge rollover you know, on a monthly basis there. So as you can see there, there's plenty that we can use there by seeing what uh, the, the the large speculators do in the futures markets and looking for when their positioning is diverging away from uh, the market or whether they're extremes. I've already talked at the beginning, you know, in my trading community, we talk about this sort of stuff, you know, quite a lot. So if you're still unsure, like I said at the beginning, you can join my training community for free. Um, all you need to do is open up an account with Tickmill. So uh, if you go back to that link that I've posted in the chat box there, that'll bring you through to this little microsite that Tickmill has put together. And uh, if you open an account through this site, then um, they will get you free access. You need to read all the information on there but you got access to my trading room all my trading community and it's a great community and um where we're doing all this stuff in real time every week of the year every day of the year or you know you know what i mean i'm gonna say every day yeah there's holidays okay right let's go back to the slides i told you this might take a while what about retail positioning then? How am I doing for time? Oh, no, I thought I might have it done in 45 minutes. Retail tra traders, as I've already said, spend most of their time doing the opposite of the underlying trends. We want to see when they are reaching maximum pain in their positioning. 
because they're always going the opposite of what the markets are doing. I'll show you in a second. But when they're at the point of max pain, then we can look for signs of a reversal. Okay, so here's a nice screenshot of exactly what I'm talking about here. I'll, I'll uh, explain to you this indicator in just a moment. But essentially, this indicator is the FXCM, large FX broker. Uh, they created this SSI, which is the Speculative Sentiment Index, many years ago. And so you can get that data and put it into an MT4 platform, and it then creates these histogram bars. And so as you can quite clearly see, uh, generally speaking, when I've got this on the euro, so when price is going up, what do retail traders do? Oh, they start getting net short. Then as price comes to comes down they start getting net long and vi and then right now i took this screenshot i think yesterday when i was putting the slides together um they are you know <laughs> building a big net short positions why do they do it to themselves all the time market goes up now of course that's not everyone um but it's on net on a net basis so of course there'll be retail traders who are long um but collectively there are more of them a short shorting the the euro dollar over this past few weeks than those who are long and they don't use stop losses and so they get themselves into all sorts of trouble and when i talked about max pain um there is a point of course where lots of them will just throw in the towel and just close out of their trades so what is that max pain level well on this indicator i've used this indicator for years um because i've found that it quite useful as a visual tool to see what the retail are doing so you can see there's a, a scale here down the right hand side uh plus three or minus three so if they get to minus three they haven't as yet or if they go to plus three, if when they're net long, then that's usually getting close to, oh, okay, it's certainly getting to a, a close to max pain. And I've been using this for years. So very often, if they do get to minus three, it's not happening all the time, but if they do get to minus three, right, we're getting close to max pain, right, we want to look for now, because when they get to max pain, they throw in the towel. And so often, once they collectively throw in the towel, it's just after that that the market peaks and then actually comes back down. So um, so if we got to minus three down here, then certainly it would suggest to me that we're getting very close to probably a near-term high, you know, if we got that. So that's how I would use, and that's how I do use, this indicator. Now, if anyone here uses MT4, um, then... Uh, to get that indicator just go across to i have no relationship with the fx engineer but just go to this website called fxengineer.com and if you come on to here click on mt4 and then the mt4 fxcm ssi indicator and then you can click on that oops no don't want to do that i don't want to look oh maybe i'll just click on learn more i haven't done this for it obviously i haven't been on this website for a long time there you go and it's a one-off it's a yeah it's 99 dollars. it's not much money and it's a one-off that's it. it's a lifetime license that you get and i bought this years ago and it's been really good and i'm quite happy to recommend that okay so that's one indicator of what um of um uh, that i use with with retail okay ah right okay <laughs> outside of that what else can we use well you can go to something like my effects my effects book.com and uh go into community outlook and then so you click on community then outlook then click on uh euro dollar for example so if i go back there we go so community and outlook get rid of the adverts oops there we go so it will list a load of currencies and it'll give you a snapshot from my FX book 
on retail trader positioning. So it's saying right now that they're about, what, 90%? Sure, if I put my cursor on it, it will show me. If I put my cursor over there, yeah, around 90% short right now. Well done, retail. <laughs> so now you might say, well, is that reaching Max Payne, Charlie? Well, the, the one thing with my FX book, is and there's nothing wrong with it as a source but lots of traders upload or download their their uh trading accounts um into it the problem is that a lot of those trading accounts are demo accounts so people use it use put demo accounts together and they like to upload their results and and their live trading into um my fx book as a uh, as a uh, as a resource to log all of their stuff but the problem with demo accounts is they are they are what they say they are they're demos so um so you're always going to see a bigger extreme in these than you might see an actual brokerage so by all means we can use this um but we need to make sure well what's the context like so if i click on the actual symbol itself and don't worry if i'm going too fast remember you can watch the recording of this so if i now scroll down change the chart to a daily d1 over here and then there's a scroll button down the bottom because at the moment it's only giving me a couple of months worth what it's actually showing me is that from a positioning perspective you can see well a retail at an extreme here you know, in relative terms to their prior movements and trades. Well, if I scroll this back further, oops, didn't mean to do that. I mean to just drag that. There we go. So now it takes me back. It's given me about four years worth of data here. So I can see that right now in the euro dollar, in, in relative terms, it's the biggest short position that we've seen in four years so are they at max pain are they at max pain like i've already said a lot of that data is um you know from demo accounts so we're not they're not i don't think they are plus also you've got to put it into the context of what the euro dollar has been doing over the last four years so if i take this to maybe a weekly chart and in the context of the last four years generally speaking what's the euro dollar done well it's had this whopper of a move down from 2021 uh into uh late 2022 yes it's off those lows um back here from 2022 but from a context perspective retail probably haven't had the chance to get you know too extreme in their positioning so i'm not entirely sure that 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 is an extreme plus that website although it's good to go and check we can't entirely trust that data so if i now come across to uh this website fxssi.com forward slash tools forward slash current hyphen ratio now this shows us a number of brokers and resources and what their clients positioning is including my fx book which yes is a 90 percent but let's actually no now look at some other brokers that are available on this side such as ig markets big broker Duke's copy uh fxcm themselves oanda they're a bit more reasonable in their client positioning so duke's copy sitting at 72 percent ig markets 70 fxcm 64 so we're not actually at extremes well what would be an extreme when we look at some of those other sources such as ig or fxcm 80 to 85 percent so if you saw euro dollar or pound dollar at 80 to 85 percent we're pretty much at max pain so clients are going to retail traders are going to start bailing out um 
and therefore we're close to a top, uh, at least a near-term top. Something like the Aussie dollar actually can go stretch higher, so that the Aussie dollar quite often needs to go to uh, 90% net short uh, on one of these sources. So, and you get used to seeing it. I've used this stuff over the years. So um, from, from experience, I know what some of these markets need to go to. So really useful stuff to see where are retail traders positioned. Yes, they're going to be short. Because when a market goes up, like the euro has been in recent weeks, or the pound dollar has in recent weeks, I know it's coming down today, but in over the last three weeks, it's been going up. And as we've seen, retail traders get short as a market goes up. There's nothing wrong with going short as a market goes up if you've got a technical strategy giving you a sell signal. Um, but what I'm talking about is lots of retail just go short on gut instinct and don't use stop losses. That's the crowd that we're really talking about here. So we can combine sentiment from all sorts of sources. We can look at retail uh, sentiment, as I've just shown you here, some websites I've just given you, plus also uh, an indicator if you wanted to use it, then you could use that. But just those websites are really useful. There's another one, I, uh, there's an I, uh, dailyfx.com hyphen, uh, forward slash sentiment report so again a similar sort of thing you can get an idea and it's to basically just takes the ig data and you can see well what's it saying about the euro dollar yeah 70 percent are short so same thing so let's uh summarize here oops oh no that's not it Come back to that. Uh, okay. Okay. Look for extremes in sentiment when price is into technical levels. So if there are extremes, then um, in sentiment. But if it's in line with technical levels and reversal technical signals, then fine. Use the COP report, the Commitment of Traders report, as I've shown here this evening. Uh, for both extremes, as I showed with the Aussie dollar um, and with the S&P last year, um, but also divergences, as I showed with the euro uh, in the summer of last year and from 2017, remember. Track major publications, Reuters, Financial Times, all those ones that I showed earlier today, earlier tonight. By the time they report on something, it's so often already done and use retail trader extremes in the co in context with technical levels um as when as when they are at maximum pain that's when retail traders bail out and usually just after they've all bailed out the market goes the other way so we can use all of that information two more things the link tickmill dot link forward slash charlie burton i've already put that link into the description box tonight but do take that link check it out it takes you back to oops i didn't mean to do that it takes you back to that website i'd love some of you to join me in my community check it all out if you can open an account with tickmill they're a brilliant broker i've been working with them for the last uh oh down a year or more now or 18 months and uh, it's a great deal that they're doing for you. They basically will pay for you to join my community. So do check out that website. And at the bottom, there's resources. We've got the previous webinars, as I've said, down the bottom. You can click on the arrow there, and there's a load of the webinars down there at the bottom. Okay. Um, lastly, then, coming back to the slides one last time. One thing to bear in mind uh, for this year, um, I talked about this in my stats webinar last um, last month. Watch out! I know we're only in we're only in July at the moment, and there can be dips, as you can see, in the second half of July. Statistically, the second half of July is weak. Just so you know. However, um, don't be surprised if uh, the market ended up stock market that is 
made new highs into August, September before the before a larger correction prior to what? The US election. This data is the average S&P year from uh, during an election year from 1950 to current. Okay, so just bear that in mind. One last thing, a little reminder for you, and this is from Bill Lipschutz, a uh, very highly uh, famous trader who, who appeared in, uh, he was interviewed in Market Wizards. If a trader is motivated by the money, then it's the wrong reason. A truly successful trader has got to be involved and into trading. The money is the side issue. The principal motivation is not the trappings of success. It's usually the byproduct. Simply stated, the game is the thing. What he's essentially saying there in that note, all those uh, many years ago, you've got to love the art and the game of trading. The, six, the money and all that is the byproduct. You've got to be passionate about it. When it's boring, when the markets are going sideways or whatever, or you're in a drawdown, you've got to love all aspects of trading is what he's saying there. If all you're in it for is the money, as soon as you have a drawdown or a boring flat period, you're going to be off. So you've got to really immerse yourself in it. That's like much like I do. I've been doing this for 27 years years and i still love it as much today as when i first learned all about it and that ladies and gentlemen it concludes this webinar this week so this month even um if you've got any questions by all means you can throw as many questions at me now as you like <laughs> uh thanks to here um if there's anyone there uh, let's have a look uh so where can I look out for future member uh, webinars? That's already been answered. Um, I've already answered Irish's question there. Let's see if there's any more questions coming through. Who's is a load? But uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, uh, thank you as well. I can't pronounce your name. I'm so sorry. Uh, Butendak. Um, will you be doing a presentation on CFDs? Um, I guess I could do. <laughs> Uh, but the problem, Sam, on doing a presentation on CFDs is a lot of the traders who attend are already trading CFDs. Um, so will it be as popular? Um, that's the only thing, Sam. But yeah, possibly. Um, I could possibly do that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try and think of a if if it's worthwhile doing. And you know, it needs to be. Um, something of interest to a larger audience to a you know larger audience really so but anyway i'll have a think about it um what time frame do you use for your entries well ray um it could be anything it could although i'm more of a swing trader nowadays or well, i am a swing that is all i am um so although i'll be looking at monthly charts weekly charts daily charts i could execute a trade right off an hourly time frame uh, even though it might actually be for a swing trade, then yeah, I can trade off of a an hourly time frame. Um, not always, but let me give you an example. I'll take the euro actually because I remember this one well. Uh, where is it? Yeah, here. Um, yeah, yeah, there it is. So, funny enough, in October of last year right down here if anyone's watched my divergence webinar um, a couple of months ago uh, there was a load of divergences not on the daily charts but on the hourly charts right down here as the euro came down into support at 10 the 105 zone so um and so and that was off an hourly time frame so i was using an hourly time frame to get in based on a swing uh position so it's not all of the time. A lot of the time I'm trading off of the dailies or the four hour or the eight hour chart. Um, it's just wherever I see my signals. The higher time frames give me my overall directional bias. And then I use the smaller time frames, such as the daily, four hour, et cetera, et cetera, hourly, as my um, entries. Right. Uh, thanks, Blair. Thanks, Paul. 
Hamid, I'd like to le- learn technical analysis. I'm good on psychology. Uh, okay, <laughs> we'll see about that, Mohammed. <laughs> um, the psychology part of trading is something that n- you always have to work on throughout your trading. And so it doesn't go away. It's a constant thing. And so it's probably the most important part of trading. But um, yeah, so it doesn't go, it doesn't disappear, unfortunately. You can have an hour, a coffee now, <laughs> miles on. Now I can't drink coffee at this time of the evening now. Uh, you missed the whole webinar due to bad timing. You thought it started at 8 p.m. Ah, well, I'm sorry to hear that, Majid. Uh, you'll have to get the recording. Um, thanks, Johan. Um, uh, Ray, you don't go down to the small time frames. Well, I, I've just said I have. Um, yeah, I'll go down to the hourly charts. Yeah, because I'm swing trading, Ray, if that's what you mean. No, I'm not going to go down to a five-minute chart to put a swing trade on. No, I don't go down any lower than the than the hourly for that. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Pardon. Do these tools also help trading commodities such as gold? Yes, absolutely, Prince. Um, you can use the sentiment in exactly the same way um, across all of those three uh, gauges that I've used here tonight. Uh, publications, if they get excited about gold. Um, uh, the COT report, so yes, um, gold positioning is shown in the COT reports as well, plus also retail positioning. So yes, you can do all of that. Um, what do you think about Elliott Wave on being asked here in the Q&A? Um, it's fine, like any method. I don't use it. I've used it 20-odd years ago, maybe 20, where we are now, probably 25 years ago didn't really do anything for me um so i'm not that bothered by it but lots of traders do like to use it but again like any method um some people are going to like them some people aren't for me no i wasn't bothered by it at all so i don't use it but um but it's not to say that it's not good for other traders i know traders some traders who do use it uh Which indicator is good to use? Um, that's a question which there's no answer to that. Um, there are millions of qu- indicators out there, so I can't, I can't. Oh, it's impossible for me to answer that. There's no single indicator that's the best to use. So no, uh, you don't day trade at all. No, Yandri. No, no, I don't. I can make just as much money swing trading as day trading, so there's no need. Um. Prince, what has been the shortest time and the longest time you've held on to a trade? Well, shortest time, um, I used to day trade. So, yeah, minutes, uh, seconds, possibly, um, at times. During the financial crisis, yeah, I, there were certainly trades that I would be in for less than a minute. Um, not very often, but, yeah, it did happen because the markets moved a lot back then. Um, the longest time frame probably five months so not that long from a trading perspective but long enough uh johan except for gold a lot of publications but probably it will continue a bit going up um yeah gold overall is um in a good bull market yes so um yeah it's in a it's in a good bull market overall it will do pullbacks but it is in a good technical bull market trend Okay, that I've answered all of the questions there, so I'm going to leave you to your evenings, I think. Um, yes, I have got MACD on my chart. Is that the only indicator you use? Uh, no, I do have. I do usually have some moving averages on my charts as well, but I've kept them nice and clean for you here tonight as I've just wanted to go through some general concepts. So, yeah. And I have trend lines on my charts as well normally, so I've got some trend lines on there and stuff. So, um But again, I just kept the charts clean for you this evening. Yep, have a great evening. And I look forward to seeing some of you. um, If whether you uh, take up Tick Mill's deal there, um, by all means, check that out. um, uh, Or otherwise, back in September when we come for the next webinar. Take care for now.